Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third day of our Let's Reconnect Festival, a four day celebration of new music, creativity and collaboration. Thanks everyone tuning in today on YouTube or Facebook or everyone watching it back. Uh, if anyone would prefer using caption, we recommend you to use Facebook. My name is Kinaya and I'm from Brighter Sound. We are a new music and talent development charity to support mid-career artists, emerging artists and industry professionals with a particular focus on the north of England. Today, we're really excited to listen and engage in a discussion around well-being and music, exploring some of the challenges artists have faced, especially during the pandemic. I'm now going to hand over to our head of program, Kate. Thank you so much. Bob, thank you, Kanaya. Um, as Kanaya said, the focus of our conversation today is to discuss well-being in music, exploring some of the pitfalls and challenges that creatives can face, uh, along with some of the more positive ways in which music can support well-being and strategies for staying well. The conversation about mental health and well-being has become a lot more visible and open as societally we recognise our emotional needs as an essential part of our everyday health. It's an ever-evolving discussion, which is a recurrent theme with the artists and young people we've worked with over the years, but it hasn't had an increased importance played, placed on it over the last 12 months. Some pre-pandemic research by HMUK, which was carried out with over 2,000 musicians, highlighted that musicians are up to three times more likely to experience depression or anxiety compared to the general, general public and factors relating to creative work, such as unpredictable working hours and practices, the precarious and often isolated nature of the work are major contributing factors to this, all of which have been exasperated by the pandemic. Since this research and in a post-pandemic context, HMUK have gone from supporting two to 3,000 musicians a year to 20,000 musicians. And a recent survey by the MU suggests that 34% of musicians are considering abandoning their career and 37% of musicians are unsure about the future. Uh, the impact of COVID has dispro disproportionately affected creatives uh, with the end of live music, which really is the lifeblood of the industry, uh, the end of in-person collaborations and studio recordings, and at the start, a general lack of support for the freelance workforce, which has led to additional financial challenges. This has been the theme that our latest Both Sides Now Commission has explored. And the brief, which was set by our mentor, Ray Black, spoke about the way the pandemic has impacted mental health and well-being and how it's opened up time to think and reflect and process what we're feeling inside. Ray explained that for her personally, it's made her question her self-worth, question her purpose and her talent. And so with the commission, she really hoped to open up honest conversations about the thoughts and feelings in our heads, how we manage them and what keeps us going in testing times. So this is our starting point for today. And I'm delighted to be joined by our guest panelists imminently. Uh, that is um, the artist Jamal Monarch and Lindsay Abude, who are our commissioned artists. They're going to talk a little bit about why this topic felt particularly important at this moment in time. Hi, Jamal and Lindsay. And we're also going to be joined by Joe Hastings, who's the director of the Music Mind Matters Scheme at HMUK and Dr. Melanie Grundy. So I'm just gonna hand over to each of you now to quickly introduce yourself. And then we're gonna go into uh, a few questions and conversations, and hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for any questions or comments you may have. Um, you can put those into the comments section on either Facebook or YouTube. Okay, fab. So, um, Jamal, would you introduce yourself and say who you are? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Jamal. Um, I have a professional music as Jamal Monarch. I am an artist. So I'm a vocalist, I'm a producer. I'm a sound like a mix master. Um, I've been a musical person here. So. I do strategy music, I do a whole lot of things in the music, I'm really fine, and like, there's a massive kind of project that I'm really super grateful for. And I think I had a link to the West, the might will be blurred, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, yeah, I've been making music for a really long time, just for our EPD yesterday, and um, 
I'll go breaking up a little bit there. I'm just going to um, pause for a second and I'll just ask Lindsay if you could pick up and we'll talk to you in a second. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay. Yeah. Well, uh, hi, I'm Lindsay Abuday. I am a singer songwriter from Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, uh, I think that's the summary of it. Uh, <laughs> I I do production, but my production is mostly I, I usually have to work with um, other producers um, for for um, live performances. Um, but that's it in a, that's it in a nutshell, actually. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Melanie. Can I hand over to you next? Yeah, sure. So I'm Dr. Melanie Grundy and I am an NHS GP uh, with special interest in mental well-being, uh, gender dysphoria and performers health. So um, before I studied medicine, I've actually, um, my first degree is in theatrical costume design and I was self-employed as a designer maker. So I do have personal experience of some of the challenges of being a freelancer in the creative industries, albeit not in music itself. Um, but outside my clinical work, I still remain involved with the creative sphere. Um, I'm trustee and secretary of a small music promoter in the northeast called Jazz Northeast. And I um, perform or have performed as one half of a voice and piano duo called Alembic, although um, with the restrictions on rehears rehearsal spaces um, during lockdown, um, I haven't been able to practice with the pianist I work with for quite a long time. And um, so we're hoping to pick that up when things begin to open up again. And I suppose the clinical and the creative um, sides of my work come together in my roles as a trustee of help musicians and also as an assessing clinician and trainer for BAPAM, who are the British Association of Performing Arts Medicine. And also in my new role as a freelance clinician and mentor for musicians, the Green Room Medic. <laughs> so pleased to meet everybody today. Fab, thank you so much, Melanie. And Joe, can I hand over to you next, please? Yeah, hello, I'm Joe. I'm the head of Music Minds Matter um, at Help Musicians. Um, uh, I've been working for the charity for over 10 years um, and for those of you who don't know um, we offer support advice assistance to uh, to musicians throughout their careers um, uh, we offer we offer support in times of um, kind of a challenge when people are find, uh, having difficulties but also um, we offer support to, to kind of um, empower and, and, and promote people's careers um, so yeah, my, my main main area of focus within the charity has always been within the health and welfare area. So we uh, offer support to musicians who have health issues, um, who experience um, uh, life challenges and difficulties that make it um, um, that, that, that are, are kind of standing in the way of them continuing their careers. Um, and um, I've, I've been involved heavily involved over the last um, um, about six to eight months um, on. Um, a refresh of the Music Minds Matter service and, and some of the developments that I'll, I'll happily talk about in more detail uh, later on. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Yes, look forward to hearing more about that. Jam Jamal, are you, are, you, have you, are you back on? Test, test, test. Are we in the building? Hello? A bit, a bit robotic. But, a bit um... robotic. Oh, <laughs> um, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to keep talking. So, yeah, I'm an artist, I'm sure, from Manchester, and we've been making for a long time, and it's been a very important part of my life, and it's been a lot of learnings and lessons about taking care of yourself, which I'm sure we'll get into. And, um, yeah, I do a lot of different things in music, and really music obsessed, and that's kind of the thing about how all your dedication and drive you. So, yeah, I'll be here. Thanks, Jamal. Sorry, you're still a little bit blurry, so um, we'll try and uh, we'll try and move on. Um, but oh. so, apologies if I keep intercepting if the if the sound dips in and out. Oh. Um, so I'm going to start Jamal and Lindsay with a question for you. Um, Lindsay, um, uh, in fact, I'm going to try. We'll try Jamal again. Um, from the conversations that we've had, sort of in and around the um, in and around the commission, I know we've spoken a lot about pressure as being a, a major issue. The pressure on the different aspects of your career um, and the expectation to be creatively and commercially successful. 
I wonder if you could try, Sam, permitting, <laughs> um, to talk a little bit about these pressure points and the way that they all intersect and come together. Am I, is that for me to start or for Jamal? <laughs> Maybe if you start, Lindsay, I think Jamal's, I can't tell if Jamal's frozen, but yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm still here. I'm still here. All right, thanks. Go ahead, Lindsay. <laughs> Okay, um, well, I think that there's, a, there's usually a thin line between you being an artist and you being a human being for some, for some reason, because art is like an expression of um, what it is or your experiences and what you have, what you go through. Um, usually, I mean, there is the, you start with the want, with the want to, express and create the way that you want but then there's a thing about coming to the spotlight and the expectations that come with that and i think that somehow um people who enjoy music that are made by artists somehow forget that they are human beings so there's this expectation that um if they have some connection to what you've made or to your music the expectation is that they will keep that connection will continue to be there. And the moment that you want to take a break <laughs> because you're also going through life, then it becomes a problem where people are expecting you to, you know, provide and give what they want you to give them. So I think that there's that there's that burden of not wanting to let the people who came who came or who liked your music in the first place, you're you're trying not to let them down. Um, and also trying to give yourself time to breathe and time to um, reassess or recalibrate. Um, and, and that can be a little, that can be pretty difficult to do or to balance. And I think that's, that's also why um, a, a bunch of us have not really had it um, easy talking about the things that we go through because we want to, we want to see, it's like you're coming to a doctor for something, you you have an illness and you, meet a doctor and you say, this is what's wrong with me. And the doctor gives you, you expect that the doctor will give you something that will make you better. I think that people lean on artists that way. And the moment that that doesn't happen the way that they want, there's the, um, some sort of disappointment. And sometimes people have you know, tried to laugh out at you or something um, for their own, <laughs> for whatever it is that they're dealing with. Um, it's hard for us um, as artists to try to please everybody uh, or to please the people that love our music because they are supporters. But then it's important that they know that we also go through things like they do. And sometimes we need to take a step back and sometimes we need to take a break. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't care about them. We just need to take care of ourselves as well. Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. No, that's great. And it is that sort of blurring, which is something I think we'll talk a little bit more about later, the blurring between the personal and the professional um, when your career is such an integral part to, of, of who you are. Um, Jamal, is there anything you'd like to add on the sort of the similar, similar subject to that, some of the pressures that you feel? Yeah, totally. I guess it's really interesting how overwhelming it can kind of be when it's like I don't know pressure is something that's so in like is very innately and like internal like it's very much like we all have similar like I guess ways that we feel pressured whether it's like family work friends like the same types of but I guess they're all you know different intensities and different proximities and like how they affect you so I just feel like when your music like that like that being said like that pressure of wanting to like represent and give your all in the music and like push things forward and not, you know, wanting to best wanting to best your last work and i think there's a lot of self doubt with comes with like really honest artistry right and you think you it can be really really extreme and like it can be your demise as we've seen with quite a few like major major rappers over the past few years like getting involved in different worlds and unfortunately that being their demise and their, but their music was so honestly powerful 
um to more like ground levels where it's like just affecting whether you can like have a part-time job or like you have to pick between some sort of like option to get yourself through the weeks you know what i mean so it's uh yeah pressure is it's always ongoing and like it's sometimes you don't feel any pressure and then sometimes it's like ramped up you know um in different times so i guess it's about with experience learning how learning how to manage that um and it only comes through experience like only comes through experience for sure mm, thank you jamal um i had a really interesting conversation actually with uh, melanie yesterday just about pressure and the relationship between pressure and expectation and that and how this sort of turns into stress and and melanie following on from that i wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about your thinking in the way that these two ways are these two areas are related yeah for sure so this is not this is not something i've read anywhere um i don't know this may be a theory out there in psychological literature i'm not sure this is purely a theory of my own that i've developed through my experience of talking to people with mental health issues and my own experience of mental health issues. You know, I'm not talking about this only from a clinician, clinician's point of view, but from having personal experience of anxiety and depression for 30 plus years, um, on and off of various intensities. So it's personal and professional. Um, but my observation is that the word pressure can be exchanged for expectation. And that if you reduce it down, every single source of stress derives from some form of expectation that is placed on us be that an internal expectation of us to live up to whatever um i don't know line in the sand we've we've set out for ourselves or to to achieve whatever kind of goal we've set for ourselves so you know expectations can be driven by can be internally driven and they can be um you know, related to a sense of perfectionism and, you know, setting standards for ourselves that can be sometimes impossible to achieve. Um, so, and, you know, that that relates to what Jamal was just saying about artistic integrity. So that, that expectation for us to only produce work of the finest quality and, you know, the, the best that we can possibly do. But Lindsay was saying we're human, that's not always attainable, but to place that expectation on ourselves that only that is achievable, you know, that causes stress because you can't always live up to that uh, expectation. But stress can also, you know, external stress comes from many different forms, whether that's, you know, expectations within our personal lives from our family and our friends and our partners. You know, expectations could take on the form of, you know, family pressures, families expecting us to follow a certain career trajectory, to make certain choices about what we study and follow that pathway. And then, you know, going against their wishes and going down an artistic career route you know so that can be an expectation that's placed on us that we've not fulfilled it could be um you know um partners expecting us to spend time with them and to to focus our attention on them but you know when you are trying to produce artistically um authentic pieces of work you can't always give those around you the attention that they're demanding so that's a that's an expectation that's difficult to fulfill expectations can also be very practical financial expectations you know the expectation from your landlord or your mortgage company that you're going to make the payment at the end of the month that you're going to pay be able to pay your utility bill so expectations can be very practical um, financial and that those are sources of stress but i think that if you if you think about your individual personal situation all of us have got stresses in our lives human existence you know um it's very rare you will find a human being without some degree of stress in their lives you know if you find them they're really lucky <laughs> um but all human beings have some degree of stress in their lives and if you analyze what particular stresses you have going on in your life you analyze them and you break them down i guarantee you that whatever that stress is be it internal or external if you extrapolate it down to its very basic form, it will relate to some kind of expectation that you feel that you might not be able to fulfill. Thank you, Melanie. It's really fascinating, isn't it? And that shift from it being one big, a big block to what are the component parts of it and where do these sort of lots of little things adding up to, to one big stress and pressure. And Joe, um, I, I'm imagining this is sort of quite similar to some of the themes that you're finding with the research that you're doing with the Music Mind Matters 
scheme. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and some of the, the themes that are emerging through that research. Yeah, so we've been doing um, research now for five years, really, on um, musicians' uh, mental health. And, it, and, and um, uh, what's interesting is um, so, so there are aspects of uh, people's responses that remain um th there are things that have that, that remain the same there are things that kind of um are clearly um, of their time five years ago say and th and then there and then there are things that um you know that are, that, that are new and that, that are cropping up as a result of the uh, you know um, recent experiences so um which is why it's really important obviously to continue to to, to gather those insights because you know if, if if you remain static and you have a piece of research um and that's your evidence for what you're doing um, for instance, before last March, there's obviously going to be some key differences that people, uh, uh, that musicians will have experienced over the last year or so, because uh, everything's changed. You know, so much has changed for musicians, and you know, and we can talk more about that. But um, I think um, some of the the kind of common threads, some of the things that have been there uh, throughout our research are, um, and this word I know is a little overused, but the kind of precariousness of people's careers. So uh, we we know. Uh, because it's a thread, a, a theme in all of the research we've done in, in this area, that um, that musicians are uniquely precarious in their careers. You know, they have they have um, unique challenges, unique difficulties. There are also, you know, on the flip side, um, um, distinct and unique benefits to be to, to being a creative in this field. And 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 I'm sure all of us are aware of that because we're all passionate about music, and that, you know, and, and that's a huge draw for anyone who wants to work in this in this sector. Um, but then some of the key challenges that have been that, that, that we, we've seen in recent research. So we did some research over Christmas and into the new year, uh, into, um, in, uh, just this last new year in 2021. And um, and and what people um, uh, what, what people seem to be telling us was that they wanted access to um, support and advice uh, led by experts. So so facilitated sessions, but in a kind of um, group environment where they can share experiences with other people. Um, with other like-minded people who've had similar experiences, um, and, and, and that was something that we that, that we we, um, we we're aware is, is is a benefit, and we we you know we have supported in the past, but actually as a priority, as a number one priority, um, it was it, it was it was clear that that was something we needed to focus a lot of attention on. So we you know that that's exactly what we're doing now. We're we're we're, we're we are in the process of piloting. Um, um, uh, a range of, uh, of support groups and services, uh, obviously online at the moment. Um, but the plan with that is to is to use um, th this period to, to to hopefully offer really really good in depth structured support led by professionals, um, um, and also learn from this um, um, to to help us shape um, the future for a national network of these kind of support groups. Um, so that's that that's a key priority uh, from from the research. Um, and then another area from from that we've known for for a number of years is that there is a there is a want um, from from people working in this sector to have a, a centralised place to access support and, and to access advice um, um, around uh, emotional and mental health. Um, so uh, you know, it, it, in our plan um, uh, later this year, uh, we're going to build um, um, a wellbeing hub for people working in the sector, so that they can access all of the best. There is lots of really good support and advice out there. Um, I think, um, and, and and it's brilliant, and people are accessing it. Um, but what but what we we, we tend to see is that um, there's a slight kind of um, tendency towards siloization of those support structures. And what we want to see, not just help musicians, but I know that this is this is felt throughout our kind of partners as well, is 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 a collaborative approach where where we where we we, we have a central place where people um, where services are acknowledged and and people can use them intuitively and they're really and and, and you know and they can follow a kind of um, a process that will enable them to get the right kind of support for them. So sorry, I know that sounds like a little bit of a marketing push for us and for our partners, um, but just on the back of the research, that's what we're doing. Um, and then obviously, I, you know, I, I know I haven't talked about it too much, but we we, we have a core service called Music Minds Matter, um, which is uh, you know which is which offers um, access to. 24/7 um, counselling support. You, it, when you call it, you, you speak uh, directly to a BACP accredited counsellor, um, and, um, and and you can have you know um, um, up to an hour's um, um, discussion with with, with with a with a trained counsellor, and from that you can access further support um, um, through kind of a tiered service, working with um, another partner, BAPAM, to deliver um, kind of structured counselling for people as well. 
So um, yeah, there's, there's there's lots available, and we will continue to build uh, on, on our insights. Um, what we what we're trying to do is make sure that our services are giving us um, 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 as much of the insights that we need to ensure that they you know that that we're um, that we're maintaining um, um, uh, services that deliver on what people want and uh, and what the main issues are for people at, at any time. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. And there's some really brilliant new developments there that it would be good maybe to just chat a little bit about again at the end and maybe share some uh, more detail on how people can can connect with them. So thank you for that. And um, following on, really, this next question for um, Jamal and Lindsay is in in two parts, um, thinking about um, what, what Lindsay said in her first answer and some of the research that HMUK have done um, previously is about that the fact that an artist's relationship with music is integral to your sense of self. Um, and reflecting on this, um, I wonder if you could talk through some of the challenges that this has presented over the last 12 months in the context of the pandemic, when this part of your identity has been displaced or uh, lost at periods of time. Um, but also my sort of second part of the question is um, hopefully post pandemic coming out of this situation um, how you can manage uh, how, how you can manage this differently and what sort of boundaries or parameters you're thinking about setting yourself to enable you to keep that balance across the, the personal and, and professional. Um, Lindsay, do you want to answer that first? I, uh, so, like I mentioned before, the, there is a very blurry line um, between you being an artist and you being a regular human being, because there's a, art is just, art is a, is a medium that you use, or personally, it's a medium I use to express. Um, so it's, it's like a, it's, somehow become a way that I'm able to say certain things that I, I would usually not be able to say in a, in a random regular conversation. Um, but with that comes the, um, the expectation to, once you're giving someone a taste of something, you always want to, some people are, some people want you to give them that same thing. And then there's the thing about time passing and going through experiences sometimes you are not in the same position or you're not in the same place that you were, let's say two years ago or three years ago. And you might, there's, there's possible recalibration, there's possible reassessment. You could decide that you want to take a break and then the pressure comes to you for why haven't you gotten anything out? Why, why are you taking so much time to get this particular project? Or why is it that people who are, and people like to, there, there's a lot of comparison. Some artists are bringing out singles every month. Why aren't you getting something out? Um, mm -hmm. But I think to, to get into the second part, one of the things that I'm learning now is the first thing I throw is say, don't forget that I'm a human being. Okay? <laughs> as much as I'm a musician, this stuff is happening to me as well. Um, and in this, in this, we all went through the same pandemic. We all... I mean, we, we lost our jobs, we lost our sources of income. And th that came with, there was a pressure to, we had bills to pay. There was a pressure to source that out. So there was a pressure to just live through day by day. Um, and I'm gradually learning to just give myself time, knowing that I know that the industry works in a way where they, they would want to tell you that if you don't come out in a particular, within a particular period, you can't, um, you're lost or you can't, there's certain things you can't have come to you. But I don't think that that's true. Um, we've seen where artists have gone through that machinery and are not here anymore. Um, and it's important that we, we keep, we have a way to preserve ourselves. If we're the only ones who can do that because nobody really cares about how we are as long as we're churning things out. But we need to take a break for ourselves. Um, and we need to learn to preserve ourselves. It's, it's a normal, it's weird that as an artist, we forget that preservation is, a, is, an, is an instinct as a human being. We just we give and give and give, but we don't think about preservation. 
So one of the things I'm learning now is to learn how to preserve. Um, talk to things with people that I know understand what I'm going through so it doesn't feel like I'm having this whole burden on me. And just taking things slowly. If, if a project comes out in two years, know that I've given my time and I've invested my time and my resources to get this thing out. And if, if it's gonna come out, it will come out, but there is a process. And every artist has their process. That's something that we also need to understand. Every artist has a process. Some are good with getting singles out every month. Some would do bi-monthly, that's them. If I decided I am good with taking a year or six months, that should be my process and it should be understood that this is how this artist works. Um, so just general to wrap up everything, my, my takeaway from what has happened during the pandemic is just learning how to self-preserve um, so that I can do the things that I want to do, knowing that what I have in mind to do is also long-term. It's not something that is like a, you know, like really like a fast thing you have to do within a minute or within one month, you know. That's something I have taken away so far. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. That's great. Um, yeah, that idea of preservation and looking after yourself because the, no one else is going to do it unless you do. It, mm -hmm. uh, it's a sad fact, isn't it? Yeah. And Jamal, you've been nodding along with quite a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's a, there was a lot of truth in that and a lot of great stuff in that. Um, I firstly, with the question, I got kind of transported back to March 2020. And I remember how I felt when COVID first hit. And I remember that disappointment. I remember that frustration. I remember the sadness. I remember the the anger, the, the mix of emotions that I felt because I was, I felt like I personally was like gaining momentum and that's not easily done. You know, like I felt like I was like, just getting that little hype a little bit, like playing the most smart shows I had, like album about to drop, like I felt like things were really moving and that I think definitely affected my self-worth for sure. Cause I was like, man, like I can't, like when am I gonna be able to make these moves? Like I'm trying to go do this. I'm, I wanna do this in this time. And like, um, you know, whether, whether it's like, and this goes back to pressure, you know, I've been told by coaches and mentors and even my parents, like, you know, plan things out and, you know, have a have a plan one year, two year, five year plan, you know, see where you want to be. COVID threw that right out the window, like completely out the window. And um, I think for a lot of us, we had to go back to the drawing board. And that was in like, you know, we're talking, that's in many ways, but for artists, like, it affects so many of us across all boundaries. Like you can be an established act and have had your little tour, you have your little cult following on your tours, but then you haven't got a social presence. Now you need the social presence, but you don't know how to use it. So like, that's one thing, for example. And it just, that you know, whether it's like me not having motivate, like the momentum and like having to go back to the drawing board in the sense of, I was, here you go. I, I wanted to do like a launch party, for example, for the album. Like I'd worked three years on this album. Like had to, I went through loads of life experience, like similarly to what Lindsay's saying about like, you know, taking care of yourself and we're humans as, at, at, and at the, at the core of it more than we're artists, but we have to have human experiences to, to be able to put it into the music. I think that's, partly why I want to make music because I feel like and I have felt like for a while like I've got an experience to talk about and a viewpoint and a perspective and I think for a lot of us that viewpoint experience and perspective became so much smaller and so much more insular and so much more confusing um once COVID hit and you know how does that affect music I think for a while like people didn't really know how to start making music again like how what are you talking about a lockdown like the word was even the word was new you know the word the word was new now it's like second nature so i guess you, 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 maybe if i personally like I from my personal experience maybe if i looked at it a little bit more like a business i probably wouldn't have felt that that touched because 
if I looked at music like a business and I had like, I don't know, a different stage name from my real name or like just, just I kept personal parts of my life separate. Like if I did that, maybe I wouldn't have felt so many varying emotions because it is a business and businesses fail. You know, businesses, you know, 50% of businesses fail in their first year, like period. So maybe if I looked at it more that way, I, I would have been all right. But I don't, I look at it as an art form and I look at it as expression and it's, it means a lot to me. It's a visceral thing. It's, it brings up memories, nostalgia. Music is exciting. It makes me want to wake up in the morning. I get like a, the rush of releasing a new song or the rush of finding a new sound or a new way to use my voice or whatever it is. Like there's so much to be inspired by. And I think lockdown kind of for the, a good chunk of it, like the first part um, stripped a lot of that away. But even in that sense, like, I, I mean, I personally, it's important to reckon for me, my experience, like I managed to make a load of music to start lockdown because I had other things going on. But if I didn't have those other things going on, like you, you, you really do go through a dry period like this lockdown, we've had three lockdowns now. So there's plenty of dry spells like have come and they're, they're the worrying thing. Um, Cause then you're like, oh, I'm gonna make music again. Like, and then that then goes back to the core thing of like, what do I have to say? What am I doing wrong? But am I not like this, that, or the third, like worthy enough or whatever those emotions are. So yeah, it's <laughs> hit different in the words of scissor. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Jamal. And I think that that's really interesting, isn't it? About the 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 business, the the music as a business and music as a passion, and just where that how how those two things can be separated if they can be separated. Yeah, um, if if because I mean, for a lot of independent artists, probably not. Just to make the asterisks, like for an, for a, I mean, there's so many. There's probably there's way more artists that make music for the love of it than for the business. Like, I'm, yeah. I will happily bet money on that. But the, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is like for independent artists as well, especially when you're handling your career in your own hands. Like, you don't have places to delegate, right? You don't have. You're still your own social media manager. You're still your own agent. You're still your own this, that, and the third. So for independent artists, I think it's a lot more different because the, the business becomes so much more insular. I mean, you could be independent and have a manager and stuff like that, but still, mm. if you're really starting out, I mean, if you're even if you're a band, even if you're a four-piece band, bro, like you can still delegate, but things are gonna get on your nerves. Like things, you know, people wanna go pick up slack. There's all types of dynamics, you know, uh, really hits people in different ways, um, and that's the scary thing. That's yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, like, just talking, I know obviously there's been a, a lot of challenges um, thrown up, and particularly in the last 12 months. But, um, Lindsay and Jamal, you've both spoken about sort of how it, there's also been a, a turning point in some respects in the way that you're thinking about what you're doing and and, and finding different strategies to to manage that. Um, and, Melanie, I think, and, and Joe, but I'll come to Melanie first. Uh, we've we've sort of spoke about the increased number of artists accessing support at the start, and then the impact it's having on their well-being, and wondering whether, as well as the challenges and the sort of things that people are having to renegotiate, what the opportunities are um, to to rethink some of the working practices and expectations associated with being a musician, where that whether they're societal or, or self-set and sort of enabling us to reset with more of a, a well-being focus at the at the heart of, of what they're doing. Yeah, well, I think the whole dialogue about mental health is um, opening up within the music industry and the creative industries in general. You know, it's, it's the, and the pandemic has brought that to the fore. So, you know, the, the, we've all heard, even on the mainstream news, you know, mention of how um, the social isolation of lockdown has, a, has adversely affected the general public's mental health. So again, if you extrapolate that out and think that musicians are three times more likely than the general public to have mental health problems, then if it's increasing, if the incidence of mental health problems has increased for the general public uh, throughout lockdown, then it's going to have increased exponentially for musicians because of all the factors mentioned. So I think there already was pre pandemic and pre-lockdown, there already was an increasing dialogue within the music industry about the importance of mental health and well-being. 
But, you know, things are going to be, change is happening. But when you're talking about a whole industry, it's obviously going to happen, you know, the, the general change is going to happen at a relatively slow pace. There are going to be pockets of faster change, you know, led by organisations like Help Musicians, led by the Musicians Union and so on, uh, led by, by BAPAM, organisations that are very much focused on musicians' health and well-being, and organised by, you know, the, the unions who are focused around the industry. So they're going to be pockets of faster change. But in general, the change within the whole industry, you know, it's going to grind slowly. It may get there eventually, but it's going to take its time. So I think, and, and something that, again, I've had a, a, a bit of experience of through lockdown, is no one knows the effect of working in the creative industries on mental health and well-being than other creatives. You know, no one understands how the music industry can affect a musician's mental health and well-being like another musician. But it's extrapolatable across the creative industries. So, you know, a musician in dialogue with a graphic designer is going to have much more in common than a musician in dialogue with a banker, for example. You know, so there's, a, there's something common to working within the creative industries across the board, whatever, whatever branch of the creative industries that is. But obviously, people working within the same branch of the creative industries are going to have even more of a closer understanding. So the point I wanted to make is this, that there is no better source of support for someone working in the creative industry than another creative. And I think it's time that the creative industry started focusing on, um, on kind of, you know, creating support groups. And it can be kind of a bit almost threatening if um, groups are set up as you know support groups purely for mental health and well-being because people can feel it that almost creates a barrier i think it just needs to be a coming together of creative uh, individuals to allow dialogue to happen and then i think things will naturally come out um, in terms of support and the example that i wanted to share from my own personal experience so i found the first lockdown incredibly tough now i know for the you know, for the main part, I'm working as a doctor, but, you know, part of my life is as a creative as well. There is that strand to my being. So I do have and, and I've worked purely in that sector as well. So I do have an understanding of what the difficulties are. So I found the first lockdown incredibly difficult. I was so lonely, felt so isolated. And um, a friend of mine, um, Jason Singh, who is a musician, beatboxer, sound artist, DJ, uh, electronics wizard, um, you know, um, composer, um, essentially a music genius in my estimation, um, who was based in Manchester, is now based down in the southwest. So um, in the very early stages of lockdown last year, in response to the kind of negative um, emotions and negative comments that people were making on social media about the situation he decided to, to just as a kind of feel-good thing start doing an hour's broadcast every morning from his um, his flat in Manchester just playing music from his vinyl collection and just playing it and just letting people you know putting it out there on Facebook and letting people who wanted to join listen for an hour and what started happening was there would be a, there was a gradual build-up of people who started attending regularly every day and, you know, there's the comments, um, the comments box down the side of the a broadcast and people just start talking about their experiences of lockdown in that comments box. So it started off. The focus was the music. So people originally started, people were just chatting about the music that he was playing. But then, you know, th people say things like, oh, yeah, that track reminds me of blah. And then, you know, a, a certain good experience. And, oh, we're not able to have those kind of experiences at the moment. We can't go out to the, you know, gigs. And we and, and, and then that. So the, the music was a way in to talking about how people were, emotionally experiencing lockdown and then then you know when people kept coming back the same day people get to know each other and you gradually build up this kind of rapport with people and you feel much more comfortable and like I joined that group when it was already about a month established and very quickly realized that it, it just drew me in the whole ethos the whole approach of it and I found that an incredible source of support and through that group I've actually um, met some, some people who I only know online, other people who I met online and subsequently met in person. So I've got friends now going forward that came out of that, that particular experience. It was massively supportive for me. Now, that's just a very specific example 
but it's just an illustration of how creatives can support one another because everybody that was or, or, you know broadly everyone that was involved in that group um were either musicians visual artists writers photographers um you know djs um music producers etc so and and i found that a huge source of support and it's a source of support that's ongoing so we need to support one another within the creative industries i think that i, I just cannot stress the importance of that Thanks, Melanie. That sounds absolutely brilliant. And it has been really sort of lovely to hear about how um, projects like that have um, emerged and grown and the support they've provided the creative creative community as a whole. And um, Joe, does this sort of correlate with some of the developments that you're thinking about with Music Minds Matter? I know you've spoken about the sort of national network and sort of central hubs for support. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, that that's um, it, it. It sounds like uh, um, Melanie set that up because we because we both know each other and, and Melanie's on our board. But uh, I think it's I think actually it's 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 further evidence. And actually, what Jamal was talking about as well. About, um, I think I think um, just uh, like understanding um, the scale of 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 of, of kind of um, challenging experience people have had over the last twelve months. And before that, the, 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 uh, relatively, uh, it, the, the scale of, of mental health issues that people were experiencing in the music industry, um, you know, it, knowing that um, it, it, it's not something that's going to be um, that's going to be kind of there isn't an easy solution. There isn't there isn't um, you know if we give, if we gave every single person access to Music Minds Matter, it, it wouldn't solve what is a kind of a, a, a systemic challenge for, for this sector. And, and one observation I, I'd have, which, which linked to what Melanie's talking about, is that um, you know, over the last five, 10 years, I, I've, I've spoken to so many musicians and I'm a musician myself and that's my background. Um, and, and fairly commonly people um, um, express um, a level of isolation that they experience um, um, working in this sector. Um, and when you think about how kind of communal music is and how much it brings people together, that's that's pretty shocking that the people who are creating it are often feeling isolated. They're experiencing, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, loneliness and things like that. You know, we, we see that through our research. So I think um, it's not it, it, again, and this is not a solution to everything. But I think um, one of the key outputs of, of us, um, you know, um, piloting this the, 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 these support groups and, and, and more broadly the mentoring um, um, pilots that we're doing, which I haven't really had time to talk too much about. Um, but you know, the, the, one of the key outputs of, of, of this um, these these pilots is to understand in more detail um, what what works and how people want to interact and engage with with each other um, and, and what the future of that looks like. Um, you know, through a national network. Um, I think I think it's um, you know it's it's the, the potential is huge. I think for um, for for, um, for for people to um, to share experience and to learn from each other, um, and I think it's something that is um, is, is distinctly lacking, partly because of the nature and the structure of this sector um, um, that, that that doesn't happen now. Um, I, I you know I, I think that, that there's a huge amount of potential for this, and I'm hoping obviously that the uh, um, the pilot will, will, will further um, give evidence as to the, uh, of, you know, of the, of the, the need for this, and, 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 make, and we'll make sure that it's something that kind of grows, um, hopefully exponentially over the next few years. That's brilliant. Such a positive development, Joe. Thank you for that. It's really, really exciting to feel, think about what could be there on a, you know, on a, a much bigger scale and sort of connecting to the. The, the sort of formal and non-formal networks of support that, that develop. It's really, really positive development. Um, so just sort of staying um, on the on the on the topic of sort of solutions and and sort of focusing about sort of positive strategies. Um, uh, Jamal, and Jamal, and then I'll come to you, Lindsay. I wonder if you could sort of give me either a, a one piece of advice or a, a top tip that you would. Give your younger self if you're advising them on how to promote positive well-being uh, in an artistic career. Oh, <laughs> I could give one. I could give one a one piece of advice, but it really and truly means like fifteen different things, and it's it's like time management. So simple. Like if if I could have. 
knowing about time management and this this little key tidbit of just like working efficiently instead of working like super hard like there's a difference like mm -hmm. and i think that then also links into pressure because sometimes it's about i say younger self like you know i don't need you don't need to be up till four in the morning you don't need to like it's that's all good for exploration but like there's a way i don't know just a way to get it done in like a decent amount of time so you can get sleep like i, I used to be i used to be one of those kids that like woke up at like 12 o'clock one o'clock like back back in the day you know what i mean and that's just stupid it makes you feel terrible like that's poor time management like you don't need to you don't need to be doing that and it's i think in music as well we romanticize the pain like we romanticize the struggle of like oh i'm up till four in the morning or, like Ooh, and even in the music, like writing your pain, like there's so much of the lifestyle that's like glamorized as, as you know, as the, like the, 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 what's the, what's the term I'm looking for? You know, that, that, top, that heartbroken artist, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to be that way. Like manage your time and then the pressure kind of goes cause you know, you've worked and then it's okay for you to do certain things. And it's okay for you to literally consciously do something and say, I'm okay to do this. Like, no, I'm not going to feel like, worried about if I'm going to be finishing this deadline or if I'm going to be like missing something from work or something like that. If you put the hours in, in the efficient amount of time, it's okay for you to go do certain things. Like I love playing basketball. Um, I will play basketball on the weekend, for example. Like if I work, you know, I feel okay to do that. If I've worked, you know, in the week efficiently and just like giving my space, giving myself the space. Um, and I think I probably would have taught myself that a lot younger, but then also, like say the power in no the power in no like the, the power in no i'll you know make what no i don't want to use your drums i'll make what i want you know like the power in no there too sorry <laughs> <laughs> no that's brilliant and i think you've you've also raised a, a like massively important topic which is more about the an entire industry a society-wide attitudinal shift that's needed because as you say that sort of romanticized image of the the tortured artist and the sort of toxicity that surrounds that is just absolutely huge and there's just this gravitation isn't there towards artists where there's a story of you know destructive behavior that you know sells records sells press sells you know whatever and and i just think that is you you you're so right and that that shift is so massively needed that you know why aren't we we should be heralding the people who are actually really looking after themselves the and star, you know what the rock star <laughs> business is the real rock star business the real rock star takes a 20 minute nap at 4 p.m in the middle of the day <laughs> that's the rock star business that's what you do <laughs> then you 20 minutes you're refreshed you're good you can go until yeah. later if you want to. that's working efficiently that's what I'm talking about. all this sex jokes and rock and roll bullshit. <laughs> a new podcast coming up, the Napping Rock Star. My big <laughs> new business. That is a BBC Three document, like series. <laughs> you know, brilliant. Um, Lindsay, what would you say um, to the younger you? Hmm, to the younger me. Trust yourself, I think. Um, trust yourself more. Because I think my younger self was, there was the, because people give you a timer. Uh, if you don't do it at this time, you don't get this record out at this time, um, you're not going to get certain results. And you, I was just moving really fast. And the funny thing, I was moving fast, but I was not hitting my goals the way that I wanted. If I had listened to myself more, and had trusted my process as an artist that I would have met those goals without having to be on the fast lane or the fast lane that was prescribed to me. So I think that is, that's what, just trust, trusting myself more, um, allowing myself to rest. <laughs> if I feel, if I feel tired to rest because something I did, I didn't for a while, it's like Jamal said, you're made to think if you're not working, if you're not visibly working you're almost seeing like you're not serious um um you're i mean studio runs sometimes you're there for you're there throughout the entire morning from midnight till 
you know, sex, you barely even slept. The next day comes again, you're doing, you know, until the day your body shuts down. Your body shuts down and there's nothing you can do. You have to rest. Um, that the hard way to allow myself rest to also do things that i enjoy because they feed it they feed what i do as an artist as well just enjoy um other things um get into other activities and just live live and still be an artist you're not a you're not a machine um <laughs> you're a human being you, you can rest when you want to you can always get back after you've rested yeah, that's what I'll tell my younger self. So in summary, trust yourself, allow yourself to rest. Um, allow yourself to rest. Allow yourself to rest. Every other thing you can do, give time to what you can. If you're tired, please just take a break. <laughs> rest and you can come back later. It's easy to make chips. Mm. It's easy to throw mm. chips in the oven, yeah? To make a three course mm. oven, it's harder. It takes much more time, <laughs> much more of yourself, much more love, much more care, much more thought. All mm -hmm. of it. French fries mm -hmm. right here. Bacon. We're not flipping mm -hmm. burgers. We're not flipping burgers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That takes time. And I say grass sometimes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, both. That was fab. And I think that's such an important part, isn't it, about listening and trusting your intuition and what you're telling yourself because – as you were saying at the start, Lindsay, it's about when you talk about self-preservation, it is instinctive. People know what they need to do to preserve, but, you know, what sort of layers you you put in front of that um, is sort of as as more pressure increases is, is really problematic, isn't it? And just being able to tap back into that and listen and think, you know, what do I need now? Uh, I like that the theme of napping and resting is coming up strongly. I'm a big advocate for that. Yeah. <laughs> And I have to say, Jamal, you're not the first musician I've heard who says that. Honestly, those 20 minute naps. <laughs> crazy. So I've done that earlier. <laughs> um, so um just to sort of last couple of minutes now, um, I wonder if Joe, um, if there's any if, if you want to, if there's any sort of advice you want to share, or if you could tell us a little bit about some of the things that people can well, the HMU are cur currently, HMUK are currently running. You've mentioned the Music Matters scheme and some of the new developments, just how people can find out more and access and any advice you want to offer. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Actually, I was just going to, I was just going to, uh, feed, uh, feeding back into what we were saying before, I think listening to Jamal and Lindsay, you, you, uh, that is invaluable. And that's something that doesn't happen enough is actually being able to, to get time with people who can who are who are able to um, share experiences from experiences and um, talk about um, talk about the potential positives that they've discovered because actually I think that mix is something that's, that's really powerful and 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 is obviously part of what we want to encourage through uh, some of the developments around the, the the wellbeing support groups and and, and other elements of Music Minds Matter. Um, but just going, yeah, going back to the core services. So, um, Music Minds Matter is uh, is is, is um, available twenty four seven. You can call it on. I don't expect you to remember this number, so we can probably share the uh, share a link to the web pages. But it's 0808-802-8008. And as I said, you can um, you can use it to, uh, to to talk to uh, welfare advisors, but obviously um, 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 primarily you can talk to counsellors about anything you're experiencing. It doesn't have to feel like you're hugely challenged it could just be that you're experiencing um, some stress and anxiety or something that you're finding difficult um, and uh, you won't be judged for having those feelings and it's someone who's independent who can talk to you as a qualified professional uh, to, to talk to you about what you know what your needs needs may be um, uh, wider than that we've got the musicians hearing health scheme which uh, at some point very soon will be back up and running uh, and offering um, support to individuals and that's a service that um, that offers a, a hugely subsidized rate for people to access um, um, molded custom molded in earplugs and, uh, to protect their hearing obviously that's another thing that we know is a massive issue in this in the in, in the music sector and we've you know we're, we're trying to kind of um, uh, alongside partners affect 
really positive change there. And then, uh, you know, if, if you have any questions around anything you're experiencing that, that fall outside of that, but, but potentially a difficulty for you, um, I'd encourage you to call our frontline team um, 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 through the Health and Welfare Service, um, and they should be able to, to give you some advice, signposting and support potentially around whatever you're finding difficult. So um, that's just really brief, but yeah, that's what I'd say. Thanks very much, John. I've just noticed that um, we've pasted links to the Music Minds Matter scheme and um, also to uh, a couple of other interesting articles and some of the um, links out to BAPAM as well uh, on there. So that, that's in the comments. And just scrolling through, actually, it looks like over the course of the conversation, we've we've covered all the, the questions that have been answered. So, um, Melanie, I'm, I'm just going to close with you, please. That, that same question that I was asking Joe, whether there's any sort of specific bits of advice that you would offer to musicians and and any sort of key um, uh, support networks that you can signpost people to, please. Yeah, so the key piece of advice is talk. You know, if you recognise that things are getting a bit wobbly, please talk, please talk. You know, if, if other people don't know that something's going on with you, you can't access help. The first step to getting help in whatever form it may be is to talk. And, you know, it can be, especially if you're experiencing mental health problems and especially really severe mental health problems, and especially if it's the first time, it can be really, really frightening. Um, and I, one thing I say to patients when I see them in, in, in GP is, you know, the, the hardest conversation you're ever going to have is this first conversation with me. It's never going to be as hard as it is that first time you open up to somebody. And from my own personal experience, I, I know, and I sometimes say to patients, I've sat in that chair as well. I've, I've been sitting where you are today. I know how hard it is. That first conversation is the hardest, but once you've broken the ice, you know, you're, you're on the way. And, you know, talk to whom? So, you know, talking to a professional about whatever you're experiencing can be really, really intimidating. Just talk to someone you trust. That's the first step. That's all you need to do. Someone you trust, a friend, you know, a, a loved one, um, you know, maybe, maybe it would be uh, if you're a musician, if you've got a really good uh, relationship with your with your manager or, or somebody that you work with, just talk to somebody, just open your mouth and start talking. Once you, like I say, once you've made that first move, every other person you talk to after that will come more easily. And, you know, by the time you get you get sat in the in the chair opposite your GP, you'll have hopefully talk to a couple of people about it and it, it'll feel much easier. Um, so. That's my my single piece of advice, really, is just talk when things start to feel wobbly. In terms of specific sources of help, so um, Joe has mentioned help musicians, so I have to mention kind of the sister organisation, BAPAM, the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. So you can find contact details for BAPAM on their website and what BAPAM can offer are whether you're having a mental health problem or a physical health problem, they can offer um, GP assessment appointments. So I work as an assessing clinician for BAPAM, so you get to speak to somebody like me who has an awareness of the specific issues that um, affect performers' health. And um, you get an hour-long consultation for free where you can discuss what the problem is, how it's affecting your ability to perform, whether there's any background history to the problem that you're explaining, and then that clinician will be able to signpost you to specific sources of help. And sometimes that will be, if in, in the case of musicians, that will be, um, you'll be referred back to help musicians to potentially access funding, which will allow you to get treatment from much more specialist sources than is available via the NHS, or if the um, particular input that you need is available via the NHS, but there's a long, long waiting list for it, then um, help musicians can help you to fund um, so you can access that to help privately. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Melanie. That's great. Um, thank you all. Thank you all. Huge, huge thanks for really uh, openly, honestly discussing this topic and for your advice and for all the support that you've um, made people aware of and uh, just to reiterate again for anyone who who wants to find out more about those different uh, sources to help there are links in the comment comments section there too 
follow. Um, so thank you all very, very much again. And I'm just going to hand back to Kanaya, who's just going to close the session and talk a little bit about what, what else is on with the festival. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to everybody. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to everybody for joining us this afternoon. If you'd like to watch this event back, it will be available on the Brighter Sound Facebook page. Carrying on with the theme of well-being, tonight we're really looking forward uh, to celebrate new music cre created by young musicians from our new track project. Um, so. New Track is a music and well-being project to support young people to develop new music skills, have fun, feel more connected and manage their own well-being. Um, tonight we'll share the New Tracks, an animated music video, and discuss the role of music and creativity in supporting young people's mental health and well-being with facilitators Holly Phelps, Baljar Samurai and Laura Jackson. That's at 6 p.m. on the Brighter Sound Facebook page. We hope to see some of you there. To check of what's happening tomorrow on the fourth and final day of the festival, please visit our website, brightersound.com. Let's reconnect. Thank you so much.